Howdy, gang. TGIF. Yes, it is Friday. And you may have some really exciting plans already scheduled for the weekend. Or it's very possible you're going to hunker down, stay warm, and play some games. I don't know. I have absolutely no idea what you've got planned. I'm not psychic, for crying out loud. But one thing I can tell you for sure is the Daily Dope is in the air. Hello, gang. I am Jeff McAleer, your host here at The Daily Dope, as well as uh, happening to be the Grand Poobah of the GamingGang.com. And welcome aboard. Today is Friday, January 5th, 2018, and I've got lots of fun planned for today. Got some news. Uh, we're starting to see a little more news pop, so that's cool. I love covering the news. And uh, I do have to point out that sometimes I do kind of, I don't mock the news, but I do throw out some wisecracks once in a while. And I did have someone email me at mailbag at thegaminggang.com asking, uh, don't companies get mad when I sort of, you know, tease them? They thought I was kind of mocking them. It's like, no, I'm not mocking anybody. I'm just kind of kidding around about some of the the press releases. That's all. Sometimes they read sort of strangely. But anyway, uh, before I jump into the news today, I do want to give out a special shout out to Jonathan from a game, uh, an Adventure a Week Games. Let's try that again. An Adventure a Week Games. And he was super, super nice. I reached out to, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm reaching out to some companies I've never really tackled in the past. And he was super, super nice. And he sent along some really cool uh, PDFs over on Drive-Thru RPG for me to peek at. So we will be uh, trying to get some PDF reviews out there. Thursdays is kind of the RPG day that I like to do, not to say that it's only going to be on Thursdays, because Mondays and Tuesdays are kind of wide open right now, but uh, I did want to say, uh, uh, give a big thanks, big shout out to Jonathan over at an Adventure Week Games, and uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about that company and their products in the very near future. So I also have a review today that I'm sure quite a few people will pop in to take a peek at, and it is from my good pals over at GMT Games. It is Welcome to Centerville from designer Chad Jensen. And because I have the game set up, obviously enough, this is just the box top, the magic of video. So... I am going to be doing a review of Welcome to Centerville in just a little bit. But there is a a bit of news, some cool news that's floating out there. And I have to admit that uh, it's pretty wild. Every time I turn around, it seems as if Renegade Game Studios has another thing coming for Raiders of the North Sea. And now they've got two items coming for the Raiders lineup. That's right, because you'll have two new additions on January 17th, and you have available to you a couple of expansions. First off is Raiders of the North Sea Hall of Heroes. And in Raiders of the North Sea Hall of Heroes, a meat hall has been constructed, attracting a new breed of adventurers. Each raid brings new quests for the daring to endure. But with meat in abundance, I like when that happens. There's little room for the wary. So sharpen your axe and ready your shield. There are new adventures awaiting. Hall of Heroes brings in new ways of gaining resources, acquiring crew. Well, yeah, you're tempting them with all that delicious alcoholic mead. And there's new ways for you to score victory points as well. After each raid, a new quest is placed onto the board. To complete a quest, a player or players will need to send, discard, warriors from their hand of a certain strength value. 
Once completed, the quest is placed above a player's board and will score victory points at the game's end. Each quest also rewards players with iron, gold, silver, and other resources. Silver and gold, silver and gold. Yes, I know it's not the holiday season anymore, and I am certainly no Burl Ives, but just thought I'd float that out there. Players can also collect mead, mmm, yummy, 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 which can be spent during a raid to fuel their crew and gain even more strength in battle. Yes, alcohol-fueled warriors. I do want to point out that uh, Hall of Heroes is not a standalone game, and it will require Raiders of the North Sea to play. It's for two to five players, ages 12 and up, plays in about 60 to 80 minutes, and carries an MSRP of $50. But wait, as they like to say on TV, there's more. In Raiders of the North Sea Fields of Fame, enemy Jarls have joined forces to help defend against the onslaught of raids on their settlements. But despite their threats, there is fame awaiting those who seek to kill or subdue them. Encountering a Jarl is sure to bring injury, but now is no time for the faint-hearted. Onwards to the battlefield! Fields of Fame brings a new dynamic into the game with the addition of Jarl tokens being mixed in with the Plunder and Valkyrie. When taking a set of Plunder with one or more Jarls, the reigning player must reveal from the draw pile which Jarls they are encountering. They have the option to kill for fame and other rewards, or subdue to recruit them, or simply flee. Run away! Killing and subduing will bring wounds to a player's crew, but fleeing will lose them fame or victory points. Players can also gain fame by raiding with overpowered crews. When a crew's strength is above the highest tier for scoring victory points, players move up with the fame track, which scores additional VPs at the game's end. Do have to point out that the Fields of Fame is not a standalone game either, and it will require Raiders of the North Sea to play. So that means it's for two to five players, ages 12 and up, still has that playing time of about 60 to 80 minutes, and will also carry an MSRP of $50. I have not had an opportunity to play any of the three now, there's a trilogy now, of the uh, Raiders of the North Sea games. But they look kind of cool. They look pretty, pretty involving. Plus it's, you know, it's Vikings. Everybody likes Vikings, right? Although they never wore those horned helmets. Sorry. Sorry if I'm walking on your buzz there telling you that they didn't have those horns on their helmets. Uh, they didn't. Anyway, our next news piece comes from Fantasy Flight Games because Bloodbound is now available. Funny enough, I think VPG just had released uh, kind of an extended preview of it just the other day. And I've got the dope from Fantasy Flight Games. Two vampire clans coexisted for centuries, ruling the night with a tenuous but lasting peace. When the Gargoyle clan began adding to their ranks more heavily, the Phoenix were forced to keep pace or perish. From there, the conflict that consumed the clans was inevitable, bringing both clans to the brink of extinction. I hate when that happens. Now, only the remnants of each once proud group remain as both sides seek to discover their allies and capture the leader of the rival clan to finally end this conflict. Gather your clan around you. Bloodbound is on sale now. In this social game of intrigue and deduction, six to 12 players embody the dwindling survivors of two rival vampire clans, the aforementioned Gargoyle and Phoenix, pushed to the edge of extinction by war and treachery. You must unite with your allies and destroy your enemy clan, but who is a friend and who a foe? Treachery and betrayal abound as you seek to identify the leader of the rival clan and capture them before they can discover your own leader. While every player's clan loyalty and rank within the clan is secret, all communication must be done openly. Still, openly does not mean honestly. In Bloodbound, you may tell the truth as you deem fit, 
but you are free to lie through your fangs if it will protect your allies or throw suspicion on your enemies. Join the battle, protect your allies, unmask your enemies, and ensure that your clan rules the night. As I mentioned previously, Bloodbound is for 6 and 12 players, ages 14 and up. It will play in approximately 30 minutes and will carry, or I should say because it's out now, it carries an MSRP of $19.99. I have to say that I have never really played too many social deduction games. I, I, I think it's probably because I never get into a group that's got enough people to play uh, it really well. Like, say, for an example, like games like Werewolf. Uh, I've never actually gotten into a group of enough people to bust out a little bit of Werewolf with them. I, so I would actually kind of be interested in checking that out because it's talking about really six players. That's not too bad. So allow me to take a second here and wet the old whistle before I move on to the next news piece. I'm drinking mead because we were just talking about that with the uh, Renegade Game Studios. Nah, it's Diet Pepsi for crying out loud. My next news piece is a Kickstarter that uh, looked pretty interesting to me because it is H.P. Lovecraft. It's Lovecraftian in nature. And I am the sort of person that you say H.P. Lovecraft or Cthulhu Mythos, and I usually come running. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that I'm always satisfied with the product, as some reviews on the GamingGang.com will uh, <clears throat> prove. But this one does look really interesting. And it's a new supplement for Starfinder from Gun Metal Games. Not a company I'm overly familiar with, but it does look like they've got quite a few products out there. And it's up for crowdfunding support. And as I mentioned, it really sparked my interest because it's going to toss in a Lovecraftian cosmic horror into the mix. It's the war, uh, I should say warrior, duh. It's called The Widow's Tear, cosmic horror for Starfinder. Here's the dope. The galaxy in which the Starfinder game is set is a vast, largely unexplored region of space, just waiting for intrepid adventurers to discover its secrets. Gunmetal Games brings Starfinder fans new exotic locations for their characters to visit during a campaign in a new line of Starfinder-compatible products. The Scent Engine, the Spacefarer's Guide to the Cosmos. Each product in this game line will reveal new regions filled with a multitude of star systems, strange phenomena, new creatures, and much more. The flagship in this line is The Widow's Tear, a 160-page full-color hardcover book. The Widow's Tear will explore some of the inhabited star systems in the nebula and in introduce you to the beings who live there. You'll learn about their unique histories, their goals for the future, Ah, where do you want to be in five years? And the challenges they face. You'll read about new technologies, including special weapons and armor, new psionic abilities, magic items, spacecraft, and more. Come on, let's get into the HP Lovecraft stuff. Many of the creatures you'll find in the Widow's Tier are inspired by the works of, haha, ha, HP Lovecraft, whose great old ones and their spawn are found not only in this book, but are also in the Starfinder Pantheon. This book will also provide new horrific graphs that you can easily apply to any creature or race, new hazards for planets and space travel, and rules for insanity. We also have a limited pledge that allows some of you to create your own creatures and hazards. We'll introduce new races available for play, including, and here we go, Angari, the Defiled, Gendova, the Tieflings of the Hellfire Syndicate, and more. Oh, okay, those pronunciations were all right. Usually, some of these fantasy and science fiction RPG titles start throwing out these, like, countries and races and names, and it's like... Blah, 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 blah. Okay, let me try to pronounce that. Anyway, each star system will come with its own map. 
We even have a limited pledge that will allow some of you to create your own unique star system for inclusion in the nebula. The Widow's Tear seeks to build on the cosmology of H.P. Lovecraft's Great Old Ones. We introduce new Elder Gods to the Mythos, along with the creatures and cults which serve them, and will even work with some of you to create your own. I do want to point out that Gun Metal Games does have a quick Kickstarter video, so let's take a look at that now. I have to say that looks kind of cool, kind of cool. Right now, Widow's Tear is at approximately 75% of the way to a very reasonable $7,500 funding goal. And you can reserve a copy at a $10 pledge. That's going to get you the PDF or the hardcover and PDF for $30. The Kickstarter will run through January 31st with an estimated delivery on the PDF for May and print editions for July. Sweet! As I said, whenever I hear Lovecraft, I'm kind of like, ooh, my ears perk up and I'm like, ooh, ooh, what's that? One thing that I do want to float out, and this is just an opinion, I'm not saying anything about this Kickstarter whatsoever, when I hear, and I see this a lot in some of the various uh, game products that come out that are saying, oh, it's the Cthulhu Mythos, it's Lovecraftian. And then they start talking about, well, then they create these new elder gods or old ones and new races and stuff like that. To me, then it's sort of like, okay, well, then it's not really Lovecraftian. It's not the Cthulhu myth. Okay, maybe we'll say it's Lovecraftian, but it's not the Cthulhu Mythos. So just uh, just my opinion here. I'm not knocking this. Don't worry, Gun Metal Games. I'm giving you a plug here. Come on. So just want to throw that out. But on the flip side, I have to say a $10 pledge for a 160-page PDF, that's pretty sweet. And $30 for the hardcover and PDF, that is a really, really good deal, especially nowadays when you're, Sit there and you see companies coming out with 80 page books and they got to make them hardcover and they're $40 and you're like, blah, 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 what? So like, I like role playing games. I'm not rich. Anyway, our next news piece is certainly going to be one that the war gamers out there who were hanging out on Wednesday <laughs> may not necessarily be watching today are probably going to want to take a note of because it does look pretty cool. And it's coming from Phalanx Games, and it is U-Boats, the board game. And it is coming to Kickstarter soon. It's, uh, it's not up yet, but Phalanx Games is actually, or I should say Phalanx, Phalanx. Nope, somebody out there is going to go, Jeff, it's Phalanx. I know, I'm just kind of, kind of just 
being lazy as I say it, Phalanx Games, Phalanx Games, uh, has actually given a preview of the Kickstarter page, which is a little unusual. You don't usually see too many companies do that where they share it ahead of time with the public. Usually it's for the press. They'll send out links saying, hey, check this out. You know, let us know what you think. Anyway, you boat the board game is a real-time tabletop game of World War II submarine warfare, an underwater cooperative war thriller that allows one to four players to assume the roles of the captain, the first officer, the navigator, and the chief engineer on board a Type uh, C7C, V7, no, it's a V2C U-boat. German U-boat names are, always throw me off. Uh, no, it's a 7C U-boat. Took me a second. I'm like, uh, wait a second, Jeff. Anyway, getting on with it. The game is enhanced by a companion app, allowing for an unprecedented level of realism, as well as a challenging enemy AI, which will push your skills to the limit. The action unfolds both on the strategic and the tactical scale, always demanding teamwork, efficient crew management, and quick situation assessment. What about the crew? Each of the four roles entails unique responsibilities, encouraging the players to develop an efficient communication scheme and use genuine Navy terminology. The captain oversees the completion of mission objectives, supervises action point costs, and is responsible for the crew's morale. Be sure to bring a bunch of mead. You'll be fine. The first officer operates the companion app, manages the flow of information. I don't recall the first officer on a submarine, regardless of nation, during World War II, being in charge of the companion app. Maybe it's just me. First officer also manages the flow of information and takes care of the crew's health. The navigator steers the submarine by setting its course and depth but also updates all the essential information on the strategic and the tactical map. Last, but not least, is the chief engineer, who's responsible for the engines, repairs, as well as other mechanical implements on board the U-boat, such as the ballast tanks, weapon systems, etc. At the same time, each of the four officers commands his own group of crew members by issuing orders within a worker placement system. The idea behind the companion app is to deliver a real-time, realistic gameplay experience. To that end, the app features the most essential instruments of the U-boat, such as the periscope, the hydrophone, and the Enigma, among others. Rest assured, however, that the vast majority of gameplay traditionally takes place on the game board, with the instruments revealing otherwise hidden information, and the app only requiring certain data such as the U-boat's course, speed, etc., in order to generate an adequate AI response of the enemy force. It is also responsible for all the ambient sound effects, thus immersing the players even deeper into the claustrophobic interiors of the submarine. But fear not, with open and play being a design priority, I don't think that reads correctly, you will be launching torpedoes in no time, thanks to streamlined rules, video tutorials, and variable difficulty levels for each player. From quick skirmishes through full combat missions to an all-out campaign, U-Boat will let you conduct submarine operations in all major naval theaters of the Second World War. Success of these missions will hinge on the completion of various tasks delegated to the crew by the BDU, U-Boat HQ, which include patrol duty, ambushing convoy, uh, ambushing convoys, laying mines in enemy waters, and many more. Each mission will require the players to adopt various strategies and play styles in order to successfully complete it, and the companion app will generate a detailed report at the end of each game session, evaluating player efforts and possibly awarding decorations, promotions, etc. That is, if the U-boat makes it back home. I do have to say that Phalanx Games, Phalanx Games, hmm, had a little teaser video up, but it's just a teaser. It doesn't really show anything about the game 
except for the fact uh, it, it basically shows a uh, pint of, of beer and someone drops, it looks like a shot of whiskey in it, so it's kind of like a boiler maker. And it just says, uh, this is not how you perform a crash dive. I don't know. I figured, ah, I wasn't going to share that. <laughs> Come on. It's like, okay. <coughs> Excuse me. You vote the board game Kickstarter campaign will be launched on January 22nd and will last until the 14th of February. Currently, it looks as if the core game will be able to be had for a pledge level of approximately $88. This really does look pretty, pretty cool. And I don't have tons and tons of detail outside of what I just read. If uh, And of course, later on, the news piece will go up. You can go to the, uh, the website that you're seeing down, uh, the web address at the bottom of the images it will lead you to the Kickstarter preview. There's a bunch of different videos on it and a bunch of gameplay stuff, looking at components, things like that, it appears. But I am sharing a couple of uh, images from, it looks like some play testing. So like I said, this looks really cool. Uh, I'm sort of kind of curious though, because it's got kind of a 3D modeled U-boat. Is that just kind of gimmicky? I don't know. And sometimes I'm a little bit leery about Kickstarters or just games. I'm not, I'm not going to say Kickstarters because this company has had other games out there. They've delivered games. So I'm not, you know, I don't know anything about the game company itself outside of that. They have fulfilled their Kickstarter responsibilities as far as I know. But I'm a little leery sometimes about games that that utilize an app that you have to use the app. Eh, eh, I don't know. Um, now I'm not talking about where, let's say I'll give you an example, like Renegade Game Studios, they have their companion app, which just adds more stuff into a game or like for the Clank games, it, it gives like a, a solitaire mode for the game. Yeah, that's great. You don't need the app to play the game. This is one where it's like, you got to have the app. And I get a little leery about that because, you know, what if they don't update the app after like an Android or, or iOS update and it doesn't work right? And that's what kind of throws me off a little bit. I'm not knocking the fact that it uses an app, but I'm sometimes a little bit leery. Just saying, just to, I'm just honest with you guys. You, I think uh, the folks out there already know that I just tell you what's on my mind. It's just my opinion. That's all it is. Take it for what it's worth. But I will talk about another company that uh, I have a pretty high opinion of. <laughs> and in my final news piece, Victory Point Games has a new game coming out very soon. That's right because Chariots of Rome is on the horizon from Victory Point Games. And this one looks like it's mighty cool, folks. So here is the dope from VPG. Rome, 10 BC. Caesar Augustus has erected a mighty obelisk in the center of the enormous Circus Maximus in tribute to his conquest of Egypt. Banners of the red, white, green, and blue factions wave in the stands as the fans cheer on their favorite drivers and teams. Here will be tested the skill of the drivers and the caprice of the gods. There can be only one victor. The chariots are taking their starting places and soon the thunder of the numerous quadriga, I believe that is how it's pronounced, quadriga, four horse-drawn chariots racing at breakneck speeds will echo among the crowd of a quarter million. Banners of the red, white, green, and blue factions wave in the stands as they cheer on their fans. Or, I'm sorry, as their fans cheer on their drivers and teams. Only the whims of the gods and the skill of the drivers will determine the victor. Jerry's of Rome from designer Sean Young. Sean Young? I thought, well, I guess her career is over pretty much in Hollywood. Maybe she's turned her sights to game design. I'm teasing. I'm sure it is not Sean Young, the actress. Anyway, Chariots of Rome is a simple yet brutal 
competitive chariot racing board game for two to eight cunning drivers set in ancient Rome's grand stadium, the Circus Maximus. Each player controls a unique charioteer character and competes on the giant track for two or more laps. Players can also drive with one of four teams of two chariots, each representing a different historical Roman racing faction. But there's more to winning the laurel wreath of victory than handling dangerous corners. Charioteers can whip and ram their opponents to dramatically hinder them during the race, much to the crowd's delight. The gods are watching too, along with the tens of thousands in the crowd, and they might be inclined to influence the race in their favor. So mount your chariot, tie the reins around your waist, tightly grasp your whip, and pay tribute to Caesar in Chariots of Rome. Chariots of Rome is for two to eight players, ages 14 and up, plays in around one to two hours, and it should, I am not positive yet, it should carry an MSRP of around $39. I do not have an exact release date for Chariots of Rome as of yet. I do know it's coming soon. I'm taking a guess. It's, we're probably looking at maybe a couple months tops. I don't think it's much more than that. Might be sooner. So anyway, I just wanted to uh, to mention that. And I don't need the teleprompter anymore. So let's get rid of the teleprompter. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm kind of fighting off a little bit of a cold that seems to be setting in. Mm. Uh, hopefully it just kind of stays at bay. But uh, I do want to point out, Cherry Room looked pretty, pretty cool. And I recall back in the day, back in high school, that uh, we played a, a bit of Circus Maximus, which was an Avalon Hill game. And it's sort of funny because it's kind of one of these Avalon Hill games that in retrospect, I guess through the rose-colored glasses of nostalgia, comes across as being a better game than it actually was. I, I'm i not saying anything about Cherries of Rome, because there's actually a little uh, PC game, God, I think it's Quadriga is the name of it, that I've played a bunch of, and it's the same kind of thing. It's chariot races and that, but I mean, it's like not anything to write home about graphically by any stretch of the imagination, but it's loads of fun. But I, I recall we used to play Circus Maximus and we had some of the optional rules that were printed in the house organ for Avalon Hill, their in-house magazine, The General, which kind of improved the game. And uh, it's just funny because I remember it was a few years ago, I went on the secondary market and got a copy of Circus Maximus because I remembered, wow, we had a you know a lot of fun playing it, and it uh, it hadn't aged all that great. <laughs> sort of like Gunfighter, which was another Avalon Hill game that I remember we had a blast playing, and then when I got it, it was sort of like, oh, we played this. <laughs> so anyway, all right, so let me uh, grab a sip here. Not a whole heck of a lot cooking uh, as far as the mailbag. So I think what I will do is I will jump into the Welcome to Centerville review. And hey, let me hold up the box top again. <laughs> yes, Welcome to Centerville. I'm going to mention the way I'm going to approach this review is going to be a little bit different than I normally would. And the reason why I mention that is because if I just kind of go through sort of the mechanics of the game, it's going to come across as a lot drier and less entertaining than the game actually is. So I'm just floating that out there. I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to explain concepts of the game, but I'm not going to go through like each and every little tiny thing because you're it's going to probably you're probably going to start tuning out a little bit because this is really the sort of game where I found when I was myself learning it and then teaching it to some of the gang for us to play 
I'm not saying the rules are bad or, or poorly presented or anything like that. It, you really had to play to start getting things to click. So anyway, enough of that rambling along. Let's uh, move on over here. And uh, I've got it a little bit set up. First off, setting up Welcome to Centerville is pretty easy. You're just going to punch out uh, a counter sheet. It's just one little counter sheet. Most of the counters are actually going to end up in this draw bag right here. Uh, and those are the vocation counters that are going to go into there. As I'm, I'm standing, well, I'm not standing, I'm sitting here as I'm talking and I'm holding this <laughs> in my hand. Get rid of that. Jeez. Hey, it's live. What can I tell you? It's live. Okay, so Welcome to Centerville is a kind of a, an urban development game. And Chad Jensen is well known for quite a lot of his designs. And a few years ago, Urban Sprawl came out. And it's 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 kind of funny because a lot of people think of Chad Jensen in two different ways. Those who've played like Combat Commander think of him as a war game designer. <laughs> Those who have played, say, Dominant Species or Urban Sprawl sort of look at him as a pseudo euro game designer he's just a game designer folks i mean come on you can dip your toes in a lot of different pools so urban sprawl came out <clears throat> and as opposed to this this game utilizes dice i'm gonna put the dice right out here utilizes dice whereas urban sprawl utilized cards to drive the action and just as dominant species came out Pretty heavy game, pretty meaty game, really cool game. It was just like a little too heavy for some folks. A little too much heavy mental lifting for some gamers. Oh, okay, I don't, I shouldn't say it that way. I guess I should say that uh, there was just a lot, of, too many elements to the game that maybe a more casual gamer would kind of get lost in. And Urban Sprawl sort of fell into that category as well. That uh, Urban Sprawl's audience is fairly divided. I, I got to be honest, I played it. I haven't played it in a few years. But we did play it a uh, good number of times, probably eight, nine times. And I always enjoyed it. Some folks may not have enjoyed it as much because there's tons and tons of chaos in that game. A lot of randomness in the game. And... Just like Dominant Species, GMT, Chad Jensen designed a card game which kept a lot of the really cool stuff from Dominant Species in the game while making it much more accessible to just more casual gamers or folks who, who like, uh, let's say, Euro games and things like that, but who want to be able to finish up in about 90 minutes. They don't necessarily want to play for three hours. So this is along those same lines. I would almost say that this is an urban sprawl light. And some of the things that folks may not have cared for in the original urban sprawl have kind of been left out. Now, there's a lot of randomness because trust me, you're staring at dice right now. So right now there's going to be, you know, there's going to be a lot of randomness. So anyway, so... Um, Getting into the game, I'm going to kind of explain some of the keys to the game. But first, I'm going to kind of show off a little bit of the board here. And I do apologize. You're probably going to have to go full screen on this uh, because I have stuff set up. I can't just lift the board and be like, oh, yeah, here, get a, get a closer look. And uh, the way the camera's set up, it's not as if I can kind of just jump up, zoom in, because all it's going to do is zoom in in the center. So we're not going to be seeing <laughs> get a whole lot of these things on the edges. So around the game board is going to be a scoring track. You're going to, you're going to track your, your victory points all along here, one to 50. And then, uh, you've got your scoring tokens down here. Uh, you've got, um, your prestige and wealth. And if you go over 50, you're just going to flip it over and add 50. So this is, this is pretty much your prestige. 
And this is pretty much your wealth. And when the game starts, everybody's at a, it starts at 10 down here. I just have it kind of spread out a little bit, just to kind of kind of show you as an example. So you're gonna have the victory point track that runs around the board here. And one of the interesting concepts of Welcome to Centerville is that you sort of have to balance your wealth and prestige at the same time. Because once the game ends, the victory points that you've scored the lowest of. So let's say your wealth is lower. That's your final score. So it behooves you to set out and try to be like, okay, well, I'm getting more wealth, 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 wealth. Well, because in the end, that's not what you're going to win the game with that score. So we've got that. Then at the top, we've got the green belt, which simply enough, it's the, I look at it, you're investing in the beautification of Centerville. So you've got the green belt down here. I'm going to move these dice out of the way for a sec. Then we've got kind of the, the urban center in the middle, and it's going to be broken up into four districts. This district over here is pretty much a retail. This is housing, neighborhoods, things like that. This is more industrial. And this icon here, it's a bus. Kind of look at it sort of like the transportation industry of the city. Buses, trains, things like that. So you are going to be looking at developing each of these areas. You'll also see that on the outskirts, we have these little trees, these tree indicators, and in the center, we also have a park. You're going to spend your dice. You're going to roll dice each of your rounds, I guess we'll say. And you're going to spend your dice to do different things. And one of those things that you would do, let's say I'm the yellow player, I might decide I, I want to start developing in the retail area. Or maybe I want to do some development in the residential area. All of these things are going to be scoring you points. Now, coming along the side here, we have the vocations. And the vocations are those counters I was talking about that are going to go into this draw bag. And you're going to start out, you're just going to randomly populate these vocations. And it's probably a little difficult to see, but you're going to see that along here, we have these little graduate caps. And they're showing you how many dice of that kind with the graduation cap will it cost you to acquire this vocation. And looking at one of the vocation tokens, counters, whatever you want to consider it, you'll see it's going to say what it is. So this is retail and it shows nine. One thing you want to keep in mind, nine does not mean those are how many victory points that retail vocation is worth. It means that there are nine of these counters, nine of these retail counters. I'll give you another example. Here's service. There's eight. Then we jump down to finance. Well, in finance, there's three. There's only three of these that are available in the game. Uh, there's one for energy, two for transportation, and it's all going to be, like I said, randomly drawn from here to start off with. And what you'll do is you're going to line these all up in the order from highest to lowest, because the ones that are going to be more rare are going to be more expensive for, they're going to cost you more dice to acquire. Also running around the track here are these disaster tokens disaster counters so we see them on the scoring track we see one on the end of the green belt track There's another one over here and then over here on the uh, turn marker time marker I guess we're gonna call it we've got another disaster and on the back of it of course you're gonna put these out randomly and on the back of it it's going to say okay this is what happens to this is the disaster that befalls 
everyone except for possibly one person. So we've got that. Then down here, we also have media. And it's expensive to get the media counter. It's uh, four of those little graduation caps. But the thing is, the me controlling the media is very, very powerful in this game. And I'll explain that in just a bit. Then over here, we've got these master tokens, which are hanging out at the airport. These are fairly expensive to get because, and it, and the thing about the board, and that this is one of the reasons why I said it's probably a good idea to go kind of full screen on this, is it's going to show you what do these things cost, right? So here it's showing that it's going to cost four votes. And when I take a look at the, show you the dice, you'll understand a bit better. Like I said, I, I'm not going to go into every little detail about this because it's, it, the game is going to come across it very, very dry and it's not. Uh, but anyway, so you need four votes to get that. You're also going to start off the game and each player is going to get a randomly selected legacy counter. And the legacy counter is going to tell you at the end of the game, it's going to tell you a little special thing that happens. It's scoring for each of the players. Now, everybody's going to have one of these legacy counters. They're able to look at it. So it's like, oh, okay, I get to see what it is, but you don't show it to the other players and keep it hidden. But the thing is, that's not only applicable to you when you enter into the final scoring for the game. It's for everyone. So what it does, it gives you a little leg up as far as, oh, okay, well, so I know these vocations are going to, you know, score me more. Because it's basically saying, okay, whoever's got the most of XYZ is going to get this bonus victory point tally. And whoever's got the least or tied for least is going to lose points. But, uh, and of course, the rules are going to explain that too. <clears throat> so we've got that. Then we've got the river. We've got the river that runs down here. And over here we see we've got these three trees, which all of these little icons, they're on dice. They're on various different dice. And that's going to tell you, okay, it's going to cost you three if you want to move into the river here. And the river's broken up over here, so this gets you wealth. This gets you fame. There's the fortune. There's the fame. And as the rounds go on, it's kind of cool because when you've got these... Uh, an example, put a cube out there, right? So, oh yeah, I was able to get three and I put the cube there. At the end of that, that turn, you'll actually move down the street <laughs> into the villas. And it's all about victory points, folks. That's what the whole game is about. It's about scoring victory points and trying to do so in a way where you kind of balance the, the what kind of like your, your wealth and power is kind of how you're trying to balance these things out. And it's sort of funny because in one of the games, and I tried to explain this a couple of times, and uh, one of the players who's part of the gang, but he's more along, he, I, I kind of joke around, he's a, he's a friend of my nephew, Cameron, that he's always, he's not like a sneaky kid or anything like that, but he's always, he, when he plays a lot of the games, he's kind of always got like his wheels turning like, ooh, I got this master plan that nobody else has figured out and I, you know, I'm gonna it's gonna take me to victory and things like that and he, not necessarily sneaky but you probably know where I'm going with this there's always the person who's like mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yes yes I'm plotting I know and it's funny because he never wins he comes close and you know, a lot of times we're playing co-op stuff too so but when it's you know everybody for themselves around the table <laughs> never wins. His, his diabolical plans never come to fruition, I guess we would say. And I kept explaining to him, I don't want to call him out by name. I'm just, you know. So I explained to him, I said, okay, but you got to realize, because he's like, oh yeah, look, look at, <laughs> look at my wealth. I was like, yes, but look at, look at your other <laughs> scoring token. You're way behind everybody else. I said, that's going to be your score at the end of the game. I, you know, he just, it didn't click. He was like, yes, yes, money, 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 money. Anyway, 
so uh, so then we so we've got the area of the villas and so on and so forth. Then we've got up here. I'm gonna move these favors out of the way. Over here, I just got this set up for a three-player game as an example. This is the status track, and the status track can be very important. Status track is uh, probably a bit more important if you're playing with two players than four, because the investment it takes you to get to the top of the status is a little tough. But what the status does, it's going to gain you victory points. So you're going to gain victory points based on where you are on the status. Now, the interesting thing, as I put these favor counters back over here, when you get bumped out of the top spot, you get a favor counter, which is a little strange because you would think that getting up to the top spot would gain you the favor. Because, you know, now, you know, every glad hander in town is coming and saying, hey, I want to work with you. But that is not how it works. It's when you get bumped out. So, for an example, if the white player moved up to this top spot, what's going to happen here is you actually move them down, but you're going to flip this over to show that, yeah, they were actually up there showing two little stars on it that they were actually up on top and then they get the favor. And the favor can be used for quite a few different things. You can spend favor to get into the middle spot of the river here, which actually gains you uh, wealth and prestige. Uh, you can use it to try to, you know, not try. You can use it to evict people <laughs> out of some of their developments that they've made and things like that. So uh, favors are very important. So the status is kind of a, an interesting thing. And I, I will kind of discuss uh, some thoughts I have about this fact here when I kind of give a summary of the game. Then we've got uh, kind of the timing track here. And what will happen is you're going to have two scoring rounds and then you're going to have a final round. And with three players, you would put it on this spot here. And there's a interesting there's an interesting timing mechanic to welcome to centerville and it is the hourglass side so normally when you're rolling your dice you get to roll your dice three times you can you can set aside dice and re-roll and it's okay it's a little bizarre but some people re are referring to welcome to centerville kind of like yahtzee-ish now it's got it's kind of a Yahtzee mechanic. I don't I don't want to equate that because if I mention the word Yahtzee, then you're thinking, oh, okay. Regardless of how deep this game appears, when I say Yahtzee, you start thinking, oh, yeah, I used to play Yahtzee with my grandparents. And all you do, you roll your dice, save the ones you want, it's push your luck, and then, well, then you score if it's an open slot you got or you don't score. You, what was it? Goose egg, stink egg. I forget what. It's been years since we played Yahtzee. But at least when I would play with my grandmother, I think we call it a, a stink egg. When uh, you weren't able to fulfill what you were trying to do. Sure, yes. There's the mechanic where you're rolling your dice and you're setting aside dice that you want to keep and re rolling ones that you don't. But that's about as far as Yahtzee ish as it gets. Uh, I look at it sort of along the way of if you sat down to play a game of uh, Axis and Allies, let's say, we'll throw Axis and Allies out. You wouldn't say to a new player, well, you've played Risk. It's kind of like Risk. Well, okay, so it is area controls. You do have armies and you're rolling a bunch of dice and that's probably about as close to Risk as it gets. That's why I'm not... <clears throat> excuse me. I'm going to say Yahtzee at this point, and I will not mention Yahtzee ever again. Well, not forever, but at least in this review. Okay. And then what we've got is we've got the political offices, which run along, along here. And you got the ma mayor, you got urban planning, you got uh, police and fire department, public works, finance, and I'm trying to look... Ugh. Didn't have to put them on. 
the glare is kind of, oh yeah, that's right, the city council. So you can, when you're, you're spending your dice, you can attempt to gain political office. And political office is effectively, you need to have at least two dice to get into an office that's open. And if somebody's in that office already, you can actually get them out of office by spending and putting more cubes out there than they already have. And these political offices are going to score you victory points. But once you get elected to it, so once you move into that political office, then you get a special bonus of getting that. So you could get another turn, minus one of the, the, the green die, basically. Uh, you can change your status. You can end up changing your, your prestige, your wealth. There's all different. This one here has this little token, this safe token. That's police and fire. So if you hold that office, you get to hang on to this counter, which if a disaster takes place, that disaster does not affect you because you control the police and fire department. Okay, so, so that's pretty much the board. And then we've got the dice. And usually with a uh, game like this, eh, we'll just take the center bowl box top. Even though the board isn't really huge, I always recommend, even if you have like a small game box, ah, I got one right there, here. Give you an example. I'll throw in, ah, as they reach up. Throw in a quick plug for a <laughs> love letter from my friends over at AEG. Okay, so what I usually like to do is um, just have a small box top sitting around, just pass around the table, just throw, you know, roll your dice in the box top, you know, lay it down, roll it. Uh, we started playing and, um, somebody didn't use the box top and of course they rolled their dice and the, and the dice rolled onto the board and knocked a bunch of the cubes around. And that was like, Hey man, what's going on? So anyway, so you're just gonna take your dice, you're gonna roll your dice and I'll give you a kind of a rundown of what we're looking at here. So let's say, okay, so we got two votes right here. So. These are the political. This is this is what you spend to get in office. And to get into the various different offices, you have to have a die of this color. So we see there's black, there's green, there's purple, there's blue, there's yellow, there's red. And uh, interest, uh, well, not, I guess not interestingly, but to point out the colors for the players are sort of bland. So we got kind of a mustard, kind of a brown kind of a rust, I guess, sort of, white and gray. And uh, one of the members of the gang said, uh, hey, I'm kind of surprised that these, these cubes and discs and stuff like that are kind of these bland colors. I said, yeah, well, I thought that when I first took a peek, and then I thought, well, wait a second, because these dice are these different, more bright colors, and you've got these little indicators on the board for different things. They probably wanted to avoid some confusion. So that's why I believe the de design decision was to go with kind of more kind of muted colors. So anyway, so we've got, we've got uh, as an example here, it'd be two votes. We do have one of the hourglasses. So the hourglass automatically gets put over here because time is going to move once I complete what I'm doing. And then we've got, this is considered a fate. I kept kidding around calling it the doppelganger die because you can use this die to mimic any other die that you've rolled that you can keep. So I could make this uh, a yellow vote if I wanted to. I could make it a blue vote if I wanted to. I could make it an additional transportation I can make it an additional housing if I want. It's not really a wild die because you can only mimic a die that you've rolled. So I couldn't say, well, okay, that is going to be a tree. Well, I didn't roll a tree. So I don't get the opportunity to make that a tree. So there's a lot of different options just right off the bat I could do with the this dice roll right here. 
I could jump into a political office and, and be fairly powerful, maybe not get knocked out, right? Because I need two or more to get into, whoops, to get into office. Or I could actually use it to, to invest into transportation. And as we go around here, you'll, might be a little difficult to see, but these rings that run around these, I guess, boxes, I should say, that run around the urban area indicates the value of that urban area. So I could actually go in and I could build a two here, or I could build a two here. So there's a bunch of different options that you can have. And one of the, one of the things that I'm gonna kind of go into a little more detail when I'm uh, done kind of showing you how to play is uh, it can become rather challenging when you first come out, when you first start, when you're first learning how to play the game and it's your first turn and it's the first time you get to roll some dice going, oh, hey, uh, all right, I could do this, I could do that, I could do this. A little bit of analysis paralysis, especially when you're learning how to play the game. So what I kind of, uh, what, what I'll recommend you do is look to try to go for things that are expensive. Do your best to try to get stuff that's expensive. Now, of course, on this roll here, I'm probably not going to be sitting there trying to get uh, one of the more rare vocations. I'm not going to go for the media because I can't. But what are the odds that I'm going to get those those dice faces, right? But what I could think of doing is say, okay, well, you know what? Maybe I want to go with one of these master counters up here because what the master counter does, and it's not something that anybody can steal away from you. Once you've got it, you've got it. It allows you to change the face of that die when you do your roll. So if I had master of politics... I could choose whatever I wanted the face to be on this red die when I come out. When I roll my, when it becomes my round, my turn again, then I could change it and say, okay, well then I want it to be that. Or maybe I want to do, uh, I'm looking for political office here. I might go with a vote. I decide to go with this. Maybe I want to try to get the vocations, do that. So for an example, I had that, I could be sitting here saying, okay, well then out of these two dice, I still get two more rolls. Now, if I had that media, if I controlled the media, I would actually get a total of four rolls that I could use. So cool. So I rolled uh, some trees and as far as the trees go now granted i can't get into the there's a lot of different moving parts in this and that's why i am I, okay not a ton of moving parts there's a lot of options you're going to have available to you so i'm going to show you this player aid because this will become your best friend in the entire world while playing welcome to centerville because really everything that's the rule book pretty much is right on this card. So talking about your actions, it's talking about the votes, it's talking about, these are considered, um, uh, come on, give me this one. Okay, so we see the retail, that's considered a contract, right? These areas here are considered contracts. M my entrepreneur has a contract to be able to build in that area is how you sort of look at it. So it's going to talk about all these things. It's going to talk about the vocations, education, talk about the trees, talking about using favors, how you use a favor, because there's different ways that you can use the favors. Then you got scoring, which I'm going to get to in just a sec. Okay. So, so for an example, let's say, uh, yeah, I had my, whatever, my wild and I decided, okay, uh, I'm going to be, ah, uh, for the heck of it, I'm going to become public works. 
Okay, so there you go. I I have been elected to public works, and then I would get to take my special action because down along here tells me what my special action is. Okay, so we've got that. Now, let me roll for the next person. Eh, I might as well just leave those there. Ha, ah, Jeff, what are you, what are you, insane? Oh, I forgot, sorry. Um, I forgot my little, uh, <laughs> the black die that's got the little hourglass. Okay, so the hourglass means it's, it's just time evolving. So it's the passage of time as all this stuff is going on in the city, the urbanization of the city, the beautification of the city, things like that. So what will happen is you can, you can only have a maximum of two of these that are on the time track here. So you get to resolve this. What you're going to do is you're going to just move this down. You're going to just move that on down. It just means time has been passing. And then you get a little bit of a, a bonus for that. So you can either increase your, your prestige by one, your wealth by one, or go up in rank for your status. So it's sort of kind of like a makeup for, well, you didn't get to really do anything with this die. But that change in status is kind of cool. <laughs> so plus, you know, it's good for a victory point if you're on, you know, it's a lot of stuff going on in this game. All right, so we would have moved that. Next player would come along. There we go. This is what I... Yeah, yeah, okay. That's uh, that's cool. A couple of votes, but let's say they want to do some development in the city because the thing is, when you get into these scoring rounds, you have to be involved in in building up the city itself. You gotta You got to be in this area here. Otherwise, every time you go to a scoring round, you're going to lose points. And you don't want to lose points because there's all different ways to lose points. All different ways to gain victory points. But there's all different ways to lose points. And there'll be a little indicator here. So the industry and retail both earn you wealth. Over here, the transportation-ish and the residential, they earn you prestige. So when you're building in there, you kind of keep your eyes on, you know, where you're going. If, if you're behind in wealth, you might be trying to build over on this side. If you're behind in prestige, you might be building on this side. But to be able to build, you have to have a die that matches one of these areas. So this die roll here would give someone an opportunity to build in any of these spots. And then what you need to do here is then you can spend your dice to build. So you could build ones. Um, yeah, let's change this for a second here. Let's do something like that. So you could use that to invest and create a value two area here. Move in there. Uh, let's say that was the white player, right? Go up. Sorry, wrong one. Go there. Or I could decide, yeah, do two and go up there. Or do two, go over here. Or go over here. Or I could decide, hey, remember I changed this. I'm cheating. I had two votes. Or hey, I could actually build one in each. And there's only so many locations here. So if it's filled up, the only way that you're going to be able to get into... Uh, Let's just use these dice as as is, just for the heck of it. And then uh, we had, what, two votes? Oh, there's really nothing you can do with two votes. So I would probably say, ah, oh, yeah, I'm going to re-roll. Yep, well, there's a passage of time. And then one vote. Ah, oh, one vote's really not getting me anything. Of course, I shouldn't have spent those yet. <laughs> oh, then I would get a wild. So maybe I decided, uh, okay, do that. I'm going to make that a value too. So as these fill up, and if you're way behind as far as the, I guess we'll say urbanization or investment into the urban area itself, 
it's going to be a bit harder for you to actually get in there. Now, you can kind of evict people, but you need to have favors to do it. You have to spend favor to be able to kind of kick somebody out. Now, once you have something, let's say, for an example, one value, there are ways to increase the value of your property as well. So you could start here and then end up having this cube move over here. And as time passes, as the game continues and people are making their rolls, you're going to see this will fill up. It's not, it usually doesn't get completely filled because people are, are you know, doing, playing uh, their offices and they're getting the vocations and things like that, buying these master tokens. So once again, time would have passed and that player would have been able to uh, take in their little bonus for, for this die. Then it would move to the third player and then the third player is going to kind of do the same thing until this comes down to one of these two tracks here at the bottom. Then that's going to end that round. And then you're going to do scoring, and that's where... And this is where it gets tricky. And this is where I'm not necessarily going to sit here and, and go through all of these things. Uh, but there's different scoring, and, and I recommend that you just follow along exactly what it says on your player aid to be able to go through and do your end-of-round scoring. Now, you've got... Um, for the town itself... City, I keep calling it a city... Then you got the river, then you got the offices, and then you're going to have the, is it vocations next down there? Oh, uh, no, sorry, status. And then you've got the vocations. And as you're collecting these vocations, these education, you get um, some little bonuses kind of, uh, your, your total points scored are going to be reflected by how many do you have that are different and how many do you have that are a set so for an example if somehow someone got all nine of these retail vocations they're gonna get a a pretty monstrous uh victory point bonus but then again so let's say somebody has retail service the arts and health that's kind of wild how uh, and Jeez, five through nine? I didn't even notice. <laughs> That's a pretty good run. All right, cool. I got a, <laughs> I got a straight. That um, you'll get bonus points for having a variety too. So, and there you can score both ways. So you could have you know a set of some, and then have a variety of others. So, and then of course the media, and you got scoring for the villas. So you're gonna go through that. You're gonna play through three rounds and then once you hit this the third time and these disaster tokens once you hit this for the first time this actually goes into the draw bag so the disaster goes into the draw bag it doesn't automatically take place just because somebody passed that point it just goes into the draw bag and as these get purchased on the next player's turn they're going to uh, repopulate this row so let's say uh, I came back to me and there were two empty spots I'm going to draw two counters out of the bag here and then rearrange them so let's say service and the arts are gone and I pull out another service and another service okay well there are eight of them so we would do the same sort of thing right there making sure that these are from high to low so as I mentioned, once we go through the process of investing in the town, doing our political offices, going through and investing in the river so we can move to the vill into the villas, then once we hit our third round, then we do our final scoring. And once again, you're going to go through here. And some of the scoring is a little bit different for the end of the game. And as I mentioned previously, the, uh, the score, the lowest of your two scores is your final score. 
So if you finish up with a, uh, let's say a prestige of 65 and a wealth of 59, well, then your final score is 59. And that is pretty much how you play Welcome to Centerville. So what do I think of Welcome to Centerville? And it's kind of along the lines of how some people are probably going to feel about uh, Urban Sprawl. I enjoyed it. I liked it. I, I, I thought it's really cool. I, then again, I don't think I've played a Chad Jensen game that I didn't like. It, uh, it's a little tricky. Um, and I'll point out who it would be for and who it's not really for. So as I mentioned that one dice game that I swore I'm not going to mention again. If somebody thinks it's going to be something like that, mm, no, then don't, uh, don't introduce them to this. Uh, I, I'm sure a couple of folks out there are going to say, well, wait a second, Jeff. I thought Friday is like family fun zone, family fun Friday. That's, this isn't like a family game. And it's like, oh yes, this is a family game. Is I didn't say it's children's game Friday. <laughs> it's family friendly games and Welcome to Centerville is certainly a family-friendly game. There's a lot of things going on with it. And there's a lot of, a lot of opportunities for people to kind of get lost in uh, a little analysis paralysis. What do I do with my dice? What, what am I doing here? What's going on? I, even myself, you know, first, first couple of rounds playing the game, I'm sort of like, <coughs> excuse me. Gosh, I keep mentioning every day. It's cold down here, so it's really dry, too. But even myself, having read through the rules, got through the, the player raid sheet, and uh, kind of messing around with it a little bit by myself, you know? That's a lot of times I, I kind of get a feel for a game before I start trying to teach it to other people, is kind of play it solo a little bit or kind of schizophrenically. And even I was kind of thinking, mm, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, how, how do I approach this game, right? Because I'm one of these kinds of people who I like to have a plan. I like to, okay, I'm a couple of turns ahead here. Yes, everything, not like a, <laughs> like sitting there with diabolical machinations, but I'm sort of like, okay, this has fallen into the way that I, I was hoping it would, or, oh man, that strategy I was utilizing has gone up in smoke. I got to think on my feet. And I can, I can see where some people are going to start playing the game. They're just going to sit there like, huh? Uh, I, I kind of don't get this. Even though they understand it, they're not going to kind of see how it all meshes together. I certainly recommend play it through an entire game. It, it doesn't take that long. The analysis paralysis will evaporate once somebody gets two, three scoring rounds under the belt kind of sees how all these things kind of work together. So I, I wanted to, to point that out that even longtime gamers are going to kind of take a moment to kind of piece things together of, of how they would approach each game, each turn, each time they're rolling their dice, how they're going to spend their dice. As I had pointed out before, I always recommend that uh, go for the expensive stuff early shoot the works because uh, most of those you're going to get, you're going to get to keep them. And in the long run, they pay off. Also, you got to make sure that you're doing development in the town, in the city, because you'll get shellacked on the scoring at the end of the scoring round. If you're not at least being competitive with the other players, as far as uh, your development that's going on in the retail, uh, residential, so on. So something else I want to point out is there is a ton of randomness. Now I do not like, I do not like, I do not mind chaos and randomness in my games. I, I don't necessarily have to sit there and have a grand master plan. It's okay if I have to think on my feet each and every turn because of that randomness you don't necessarily always have to be paying attention to what the other players are doing. Of course, you're going to want to pay attention while you're playing the game, but some games you're really sitting there going, Oh yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
all right, how do I counter this move? This isn't a game like that because there's so much randomness. You might find that, you know, your options are only going with uh, green development or really your only options are kind of going for political office or doing development or getting vocations. So that's where kind of the, the balancing act comes in too, as far as the final victory point scoring. That's why one of the things I think why it's the lowest of the two between prestige and wealth is because there is a lot of juggling that you do within the game. And there's and just the way the game is designed there's no way for you to actually sit there and say, oh, okay, I am certainly going to be the political king here. I am going to create a political machine. That is going to be my path to victory. Or sit there saying, okay, well, education is going to be my thing. I'm going to make sure I tackle all these vocations, get a bunch of vocations so I can get victory points that way. Can't do it. So there are people out there who aren't going to dig that aspect of the game, that there's just... Got to roll with the dice, pretty much. Uh, even though you do get the re-rolls and you, you know, set some aside, there's no guaranteeing you're going to get the die faces that you need. So I see that some people are going to have an issue with that. I think other people are going to say, wow, there's just a little too much crunch in this. And th it really isn't. Once you get the whole concept of how you roll, you know, what the dice represent... Now, what do you can spend those dice on? It's not tough to wrap your head around. What does take a bit of time is, t is actually looking at these victory points. How do you get these victory points to be able to say, oh, okay, now I get it. So as I mentioned, I don't think this is uh, going to be like a game that's like on everybody's radar, but it doesn't need to be on everybody's radar. And I don't think GMT or Chad Jensen were personally sitting there saying, all right, we're designing the next must-have game that everybody's going to have to have. No, absolutely not. I think it's a good game. I enjoyed it. I will mention uh, one of the people who played twice with us um, didn't. Did not care for it whatsoever. And granted, we're talking to teenagers, but he's played quite a few games in that. Just wasn't his thing. Just didn't dig it. I liked it. I thought it was cool. I thought it was a nice way... Even with a four-player game, once you have an idea of what's going on, clocking in maybe hour and a half tops, probably closer to about about an hour or so. Because once you know you're rolling your dice, you're like, okay, boom, 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 I'm doing this, boom, 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 I'm doing this, so on and so forth. Learning it's going to take a little bit of time. So I, I dug it. I, I enjoyed it. I But then again, I have to say I enjoyed Urban Sprawl too. So there are some folks out there who despise that game. I don't know why anybody would ever really despise a game. But, but uh, overall, I'm giving, and some folks out there might think I'm nuts, I'm giving Welcome to Centerville a an 8.5 out of 10. Because I enjoyed it. I would uh, certainly play it again. Played it three times. And uh, outside the one person who didn't like it, everybody else thought it was pretty cool. Uh, it just took some time to figure out how, what's what's the approach I'm trying to do here with these victory points. I'm, I'm just not sure. So definitely one to uh, take a look at. But as I pointed out, it's going to be a particular crowd that's going to dig Welcome to Centerville. It's not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Anywho, uh, I do want to point out, if you are interested in Welcome to Centerville, and I kind of talk about this with all GMT releases, that you want to go and you want to pick it up as soon as you can. GMT does not have huge print runs. Most friendly local game stores only carry maybe one or two copies of each GMT title. Yeah, Twilight Struggle is usually one that they try to always keep in stock. But outside of that, if you miss your opportunity to pick it up at your local game store or even on time online retailers will run out of stock, you're going to be stuck on secondary market, and that is never fun. 
So be sure to uh, check out uh, your local gaming store or uh, your favorite online retailer if you're interested in getting Welcome to Centerville and uh, don't wait. So there you have it. All right. No, it's funny because I, I was like, well, I'm not going to go like super, super detailed and show you everything about the game. And what do I do? I kind of kind of gloss over just about every aspect of the game. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, what can I tell you? It's live. I got I got caught up. So anyway, that is the show for today. And hopefully you're looking forward to a great weekend. I certainly am. I've got some new titles that I am going to play. So I've got some reviews for you guys next week. I don't necessarily have anything outside of... Ooh, hang on there. Watch out there, Baba Louie. I don't want to start knocking all this stuff over. Uh, as far as unboxings, I'm thinking, 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 thinking. Maybe there's something upstairs I'm forgetting. I will have Capital City from Calliope Games. Why do I always, I know who it's from. I don't know why I'm always like turning the box. Sometimes I turn the box to make sure I'm not. All right, so uh, next week I'll be taking a look at um, Upside Down Game. Upside Down Game from, uh, where's the game uh, company? Uh, anyway, I will be looking at Capital City next week. I'm going to have a review of Shutterbug. Don't have it down here to, to hold the box up. Uh, it's out in the car, actually. <laughs> Plan it ahead so I don't forget stuff. So I'm going to have a review of Shutterbug. I'm going to have a review of, uh, what was I calling it? Shah Razad? Shahirazad by Osprey Games. And uh, I'm sure I'll have a few other items of note, too. Anyway, when you aren't watching the Daily Dope, please visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, comics, movies, TV. Come on, you know the drill by now. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Once again, I'm Jeff McAleer, and hopefully you have a wonderful weekend. I'll be back on Monday, and in the meantime, thank you so much for watching. Thank you.